Finally then, let's move on to the last category of functions, which are bijective functions. Once you understand injectivity and surjectivity, this is really straightforward since a bijective function is just one that's both injective and surjective. So to determine if a function is bijective, you just need to check for both injectivity and surjectivity as we've done in the previous examples. Remember that injective means there is only one input associated with every output and surjective means that the range and codomain are equivalent. This gives us a combined definition for bijectivity. In a bijective function, all elements of the codomain are paired with exactly one element of the domain and vice versa. The all and the one are keywords in this definition, so you can't leave them out. The most important thing to remember though is that if a function is to be bijective, it needs to be both injective and surjective. I have one last analogy for you in this video. So if you can imagine that we have an empty bus and these red dots are passengers waiting to get on. We can compare the passengers to inputs which make up the domain. Imagine then that as the passengers board the bus they are assigned a seat. So the set of all possible seats they could be assigned is the codomain, which is the set of all seats on the bus. The seats that actually get filled is the range. If the assigning of seats is to be a bijective function, the bus must be filled in a particular way, as you can see in this animation. Firstly, passengers can occupy only one seat, so nobody can take two seats to themselves. Similarly, you can't have two small children sharing one seat. This is equivalent to saying that each element of the codomain is paired with only one element of the domain. In other words, the assigning of seats is injective. If we want the assignment of seats to also be surjective, we need the range to be equal to the codomain. So the set of occupied seats must be equal to the set of available seats. In other words, all the seats are filled and the bus is full. Since the assigning of seats is both injective and surjective, we can say that it is bijective. In the final example of this tutorial, I want to start with a function that's neither injective or surjective and redefine it so that it becomes bijective. So maybe pause the video for a moment to reassure yourself that this function is neither injective or surjective as it's currently defined. Okay, so first let's think about how we could make this function injective. Well, for this function to be injective, it means we can only have one input associated with every output. And currently this is not the case because we have a quadratic function and there are two inputs associated with every output except for at the turning point. So to make this function injective, we need to, I suppose, put some restrictions on the inputs we can use. So that means that we need to redefine or restrict the domain. So imagine for a moment that I cut this function along its axis of symmetry and only looked at the right hand side of the graph. So imagine this is all gone. So this portion of the graph is always increasing. And if I was to do the horizontal line test anywhere along this right hand side of the function, you would find that the horizontal line would only touch this portion of the graph once. So this right hand side of the function 
is injective. So that means that if I only inputted values minus of minus two and greater, then my function would be injective because we would be ignoring this side of the graph. Of course, we could just look at the left hand side and only input values equal to or less than minus two. But in this example, let's just take the input values greater than minus two. So let me redefine the function so that we're only using this right hand side. So we have f maps our domain, which is minus two to infinity, and that maps to the set of real numbers. All our outputs are real and our function is the same as before. It's a quadratic function x plus 2 to be squared minus 3. And notice that I use the square bracket beside the minus 2 because I am including the minus 2. Next, let's make this function surjective. And for the function to be surjective, its range has to equal the codomain. And as you can see, the range is definitely not equal to the set of all real numbers because the minimum point of this graph is where y is minus 3. So we can't get values smaller than minus 3. So let's carry our restricted domain from the last step, which was minus two to infinity. And this time we are restricting the codomain. So the minimum value we obtain in our range is minus three. So we are including minus three with a square bracket and of course there is no limit to the maximum value we can obtain. So minus three to infinity and we use the round bracket for infinity. And just finish writing our function here. So this final function we have here is the exact same one we started with, but we've just changed the domain and codomain slightly. We've restricted the domain so that all our inputs are greater than minus two and our function becomes injective. And then we restricted the codomain to make it equal to the range so that the function is surjective. And once the function is both injective and surjective, then we can say it is bijective.